Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, okay, so um, I, I guess the one thing is please feel free to interrupt with questions at any time you'd like. Um, and I, I do want to start this by thanking uh, two people, Tim Peck, who's uh, been collaborating with me for almost two years now, and a lot of the work that I'll be talking about here he has been uh, participating in. So thanks, Tim, and looking forward to continuing this, and also Yvonne, who's uh, invited me to do this talk, and hopefully we'll have a chance to collaborate as well. Um, I want to acknowledge my students who uh, are uh, generating all the data that we're going to be talking about here today. Um, John, who's working on a uh, navigation experiment. Oscar, who's in the, the audience here, who uh, is working on a uh, press-to-talk experiment. Uh, Jayco, who's a uh, Microsoft research intern this summer, actually, with Tim, and also working with, on the mapping experiment. And uh, Owen, who uh, did a lot of the video work you'll see here. Alex, who's working on a human-human uh, study that I'm not actually going to have a chance to talk about much, but we're basically learning from human-human interaction, trying to inform our human-computer interactions from that. And then Puneet, um, a summer intern, who's, who's working on one of our uh, next steps, which is uh, creating the uh, UNH obstacle test, which I'll talk about soon. So um, a short outline. Um, I just want to introduce the topic by talking about uh, you know, ubiquitous computing in cars and how, what the relationship is. And then uh, um, basically talk about the studies that, that we've uh, worked on and, and say a couple of words about what's next. So you know, Ubicomp and cars, the, the idea of ubiquitous computing, of, of computers being everywhere, networked, but sort of fading into the background, right? Uh, I just did a little. Uh, quick online search, and you know, Intel certainly thinks that there's something to this, right? This is a uh, thing from their website where they're thinking about the car being at the center of this, you know, entertainment and communications and, and all these things coming together in the car. Um, navigation is certainly something that we see a lot in cars, and I did like this picture from the website of one of the major manufacturers. D does it look like the person's driving to you? It, th the left hand there? seems to imply that this is a person driving. And as you'll, you can probably guess, and you'll also see from our data, this would not be such a good idea, right? Driving and doing pointing at the same time. But anyway, so I like that picture. Um, you know, the, the Zune, you can buy that with the in-car attachment, and you know, iPhones are everywhere. Uh, so certainly, uh, cars are getting into this age of Ubicomp, where, where things are getting into cars. and so. How, how will this progress for cars? And one person who's in this field, Russell Shields, who is uh, the CEO, I believe, of Wygomi, thinks of cars as docking ports, or doc cars are going to become docking ports, in his opinion. Um, so what is a good docking port? In my opinion, that would be something that provides you with an open interface, so you could, in fact, dock into it. Um, now, if you're a car manufacturer, this sounds good on the one hand, because as we've seen in the slides before, people are bringing in these brought in third party aftermarket devices. Um, and that's sort of a reality they have to deal with. And perhaps there is value to saying, look, my car is an open interface. Uh, but then there's the liability issue too, right? So if you're a car manufacturer and someone plugged in their MP3 player and then crashed because they were playing with it, will you get sued? And also there is a profit issue, right? So if someone else is producing the faceplate for the new radio, and you're not the one determining what the size and the shape of it is, then you're not making that extra money. Uh, so there are certainly things that drive car manufacturers towards you know, opening up the car and, and sort of going into the Ubicomp page. And then there are definitely pressures that are, that are pushing in the opposite direction. Now, having said that, um, the background we come from is police cars. Because um, uh, as many of you know, we have this effort called Project 54. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But police cars, the difference between a police car and my car is that while I might have uh, electronic devices in my car, 
they're really toys, right? So if I don't have my MP3 player, or even if I don't have my cell phone or navigation device, I can probably drive. People have done this for many years, right, and they were okay. But you're not a police officer if you don't have lights. You're not a police officer if you don't have a radio. You're not a police officer uh, uh, really now even if you don't have a computer that, that you can run license plates on. That just is part of policing. So if you're a police officer, there are things that you have to have, uh, these electronic devices. And so in a very real sense, uh, police cars are the vanguard of Ubicompen cars because they actually both have these devices and really need them and want to use them on a daily basis. You know, it's easy enough for us to say, look, just don't use your cell phone. It's prohibited. And, you know, you become problem solved. But for police, this is not a, this is not a way to go. So I think that if you're going to uh, do research in this area, in fact, working with police is a, very nice, is a very nice place to be. So for some of you, a reminder for perhaps others, a, a quick introduction to this Project 54 system. Basically, uh, lots of devices, as I just said. We provide a way to in integrate them into a single system and uh, uh, provide a single user interface, which has a voice modality, so you can you can issue voice commands to turn lights on, to run license plates, and these sorts of things. And there's also an LCD touchscreen, as well as the original user interfaces. So if you're resistant to technology, or for that matter, if your computer crashes, you still have the fallback of everything works the way it used to work 50 years ago. Uh, but ideally, you can actually take advantage of, of the new technology as well. OK, so hopefully this sets the stage for some of the studies that we've done. Uh, uh, there are two problems that the, the studies that I'm going to talk about uh, uh, address. And uh, the first one is that there is no clear, it, we don't quite know how in-car devices affect driving performance. So there are obviously people working on this, but you know, there's no formulaic way to figure out if you put a, car, uh, put a device into a car, how will that affect driving performance? And then the other question is, related is how does driving performance and, and uh, your likelihood of getting into a crash, how, how are those related? Uh, just because you're uh, not driving as well does not necessarily mean you're going to get into an accident. Uh, primarily, so far, we've been interested in the first question, really, which is how do in-car devices, the various uh, uh, in-car devices, affect driving performance? And that's what I'm going to uh, concentrate on today. Um, our goals are twofold. One we'd love to have an evaluation tool. So it would be really nice if we could evaluate these in-car devices and say, well, this is how they affect driving. And this is, a, this is a safe device, and this is not a safe device. Or this is a safe user interaction design, and this is not. And then we would like to pr propose ways to reduce potential distractions. We know that there are distractions. We can identify them, hopefully, with the evaluation tool. And hopefully, we can propose ways to, to uh, reduce them. Our major hypotheses in all the studies in, in, in this work are that what affects driving performance are things such as the user interface characteristics. For example, for a speech user interface, this could be the speech recognition accuracy. Do you have a press to talk button or not, and so forth. Um, what we would call road conditions, you know, do, are you driving at night or day? Are you driving in the city or highway, curves, no. And then the psychological state of the driver. Are you frustrated? Are you happy? And of course, all the interactions that, <coughs> excuse me, between, these, uh, between all of these things. Um, and in evaluating these hypotheses, we use a uh, driving simulator. So what I'm going to talk about really today is the driving simulator studies that evaluate the major hypotheses and then, in fact, very specific hypotheses that, that uh, uh, come out of those. So the driving simulator looks something like this. And in fact, there is a link up there if you want to get more about uh, this. There is a video and a little explanation about what the driving simulator does. But in short, um, this is a uh, driving simulator with um, a 180 degree view in the front. And so that's with three uh, channels, so-called channels, so three screens. And you also have these uh, side view mirrors as well as a rear view mirror and then a uh, motion platform. The motion platform allows for uh, feeling acceleration, deceleration only. Um, but that turns out to be a nice feature because you can actually tell. Um, as it turns out, it's very difficult to stop at a line without feeling that deceleration. So that, that really helps with that. Um, the driving simulator 
um, helps us evaluate our hypotheses but through driving performance, right? And what, is, what constitutes driving performance? Well, primarily we've looked at the variance of things like lane position, uh, steering wheel angle, velocity, and a distance if you're following a car. So, you know, what position you are in the lane exactly doesn't really matter as long as you're in the lane. So are you at zero centimeters or are you at plus 10 centimeters? It doesn't matter. What does matter though is if you're weaving in and out or, or if you're changing that position a lot. So basically the variance. Similarly, you know, the steering wheel angle, uh, the mean is probably going to be zero, otherwise you're, you're going to be in a ditch, right? But the question is, how hard are you working, right? So you can imagine a situation where, in fact, your, your lane position variance is low, you're able to keep yourself in the lane, but you're really working hard at it. And that's a sign that something's going on. You're, you're probably overwhelmed by something, whether it's the road being too difficult or there's something else going on in the car that's, that's distracting you. People tend to slow down. Uh, if they're overwhelmed, so velocity and velocity variance matters, and then uh, people tend to have a harder time keeping distance to a vehicle. They might just lose it, um, and uh, the variance goes up. Of course, simple things like lane departure, right? So if you're departing lanes very often, that means that you're not doing so well. Uh, collisions and, and, and other uh, <coughs> things you can look at. Now, the eye track, I'm sorry, the uh, simulator is also equipped with a uh, Seeing Machines eye tracker. Again, there's a URL if you want to take a look at more information about this eye tracker. Um, the eye tracker has two cameras uh, and uh, also a couple of IR pods that we can use to illuminate the uh, subject. And then uh, what you do with this is uh, basically look at the visual attention, right? So things like fixations, which would be looking at a particular spot for let's say over 100 milliseconds or over 200 milliseconds, however you f uh, feel like the definition is appropriate. And then the number, the timing of these things. So how often do you actually look at the GPS screen? Uh, what is the timing? Do you happen to do this before or after turns? Or, or is there a voice announcement that prompts you to look at the GPS screen and so forth? Scanning matters. Scanning meaning scanning left to right because if, especially in uh, in cities, that's very important. That's how you find out if there's a pedestrian lurking behind that uh, parked car. And people tend to focus in on the road ahead as they get overwhelmed uh, with, for example, in-car activities. Uh, per close, the percent closed time, so that people look at how, you know, if it, as it turns out, the way to find out if you're, gonna, if you're getting tired is whether you're starting to close your eyes for longer and longer periods of time. So if you have one of those devices, you know, truck drivers have these now in, in trucks where they start beeping because it notices that you're falling asleep. And one way to notice that you're falling asleep is that this percent close time is increasing. Um, time looking at the road, just, you know, are you looking at things in the car or are you looking at things outside the car? If you're looking at things outside the car, that's probably a good sign that you're not going to uh, crash. And um, so these would be things that we can we can use to evaluate hypotheses through our uh, studies in the driving simulator and then the, um, uh, as well as with the eye tracker. So I wanted to talk about four studies today. Uh, and again, please do feel free to interrupt uh, if you have questions. Um, an older study, um, the first study we've done had to do with a police radio. And again, having this police background for the project made sense to look at the police radio. And we looked at the speech user interface versus the hardware user interface interaction and how this affects driving performance. Um, in the following study, the speech user interface characteristics were varied. And we looked at how that affects um, driving performance. And this is work with uh, Tim Peck that was actually published at Interspeech last year. And then uh, Oscar's work, um, also uh, with uh, Tim's help, we're looking at the glove I'm sorry, we call it the glove press to talk button. So the idea here is what if you didn't have a fixed, press, a fixed location for the uh, press to talk button, but rather you had it sort of floating on the steering wheel. But instead of instrument in the steering wheel, what if you just put a glove on someone just to get uh, results quicker? And then we're also uh, currently working uh, uh, with Tim on a navigation uh, on a navigation experiment where we're looking at the differences between people getting printed uh, instructions, graphical user face and speech, so that would be the state of the art types of instructions, and then speech only instructions, and this on, you know, city, highway, and so forth. 
So let's take a look at this police radio study. Um, for some of you, this may be a reminder, but uh, what we've looked at here is this is the picture of a, uh, 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 one of my students who's de demonstrating this. So you have the uh, speech user interface, which, you know, here's the press the talk button. There's the microphone so you can talk to the computer and basically issue commands such as, you know, change the radio station to XYZ. Or you can do that by operating tiny buttons and looking at a tiny screen on a commercial police radio which sits in, you know, in fact, this particular radio is in all of the uh, New Hampshire police cruisers from, you know, maybe 1,500 of them between the state and local police uh, cruisers. And so you have relatively small buttons, you have to take a hand off the wheel, and you have to look for feedback on this uh, uh, small screen. And in fact, you, given that there is something like 200 channels, this actually isn't trivial. You kind of have to look at where you're going. And um, we found drastic changes in uh, uh, lane position variance, for example. You see that uh, highly significant with uh, the speech user interface, a lot smaller variance with the radio hardware interface, a lot larger uh, variance. And by the way, this was on a straight road. There, was, there were no curves. People were just driving on a straight road. And, and they had a harder time keeping their uh, lane. And then even uh, more significant and even more dramatic difference in, in the uh, steering wheel angle variance where the hardware uh, interaction showed huge uh, variance compared to the uh, compared to the speech user interface variants. The vertical axis is in degrees? Uh, degree squared, sorry. Um, in the previous one, it was meter squared, so this is degree squared, yes. Um, so having realized that, you know, there is, you know, having gone through uh, past this, we, we wanted to get a little more information about uh, how does the, how do speech user interface characteristics actually and which speech user interface characteristics affect your driving performance. So uh, we've designed another experiment in which we had a similar, so, sort of similar task where you were supposed to interact with the police radio, but we actually took the police radio away. We, we made this a, a Wizard of Oz experiment, basically. And uh, we looked at speech control only. Okay, so the secondary task, the primary task being driving, the secondary task was speech, speech control of the radio. You had to issue commands such as, you know, change the channel to this, retransmit the message that just came in, uh, go back to this channel, and so forth. Um, and then we varied uh, a couple, three things specifically. We, we varied speech recognition accuracy, and again, given that this was Wizard of Oz, it was easy to vary speech recognition accuracy, right? Um, we had a high condition and a low condition and then um, we varied whether you had to use a press to talk button. So we, in one case, you have to push down, hold, and then release a, press to talk, a fixed press to talk button, which in fact, in this case, was uh, in the center co uh, console. And then the other option was that you had ambient recognition, so you did not need to be uh, using a press to talk button. And finally, we, had, we looked at the dialogue repair strategy, uh, that is to say, when the when there, the computer did not understand what you said, it either misunderstood, that is, it executed the wrong command, or it just said, I didn't understand, please repeat. Yes? The accuracy, how high was high and how low was low? So 88% was high and 44% was low. So it was truly low. We wanted to have extremes uh, for, for this first study. And, you know, that's a good question. Of course, you, you, you would want to have more graded results at some point, presumably, but... Uh, people drove a scenario which looked like, uh, the map looked like this, so basically it was a curvy road, and you want to have a curvy road so that people actually have to struggle a little bit at driving, right? Straight driving uh, is obviously a lot easier than having some sort of curvy, uh, curves in your driving scenario. And then what happened was that you see that uh, we basically varied the accuracy from 89 to 44, and then with or without press to talk, and then particular parts of the road, they had to do one or the other. Um, and so this is about one kilometer. So this is a reasonably long um, scenario. And um, uh, yes? Which direction? Excuse me? In which direction did they drive? Clockwise or counterclockwise? Uh, clockwise. So this was the starting point. Uh, so they, they headed up. And then, you know, there was a little bit of a warm up here. But in fact, I'm not you know, telling you the complete story. So there was training, obviously, that, that went, we'll that went on. Sure. But, but this means that the second half of the route is practically nothing. 
Yes, so in fact they did not, you're right, so I probably could have given you a slide that left this off because they did not actually have to drive the rest of it. Or, you know, they drove a little bit so that we could do some comparisons of baseline driving and so forth. Yes. I just thought that the initial part is uh, on the lower right part, which means the training, and it seemed quite long, so this yeah, is why I asked. It's about, you know, this is, this is where they ended up starting, and then they, they started the interactions here. Um, so again, the, or, or what we found here uh, were really two uh, important results. One is that the recognition accuracy does influence your driving performance, specifically steering wheel angle. Uh, variance uh, was higher for low uh, recognition, recognition accuracy. So for low ac recognition accuracy, you, you ended up with a higher average uh, steering wheel variance than for, than for high um, recognition. And then the second uh, result was that if you had low accuracy, then the press, using the press to talk button also influenced your driving performance, specifically the lane position. And you see that the, on the x-axis you have the press to talk, so you didn't have to use it in the ambient, ambient recognition condition. And yes, you did have to use it. And there, the, uh, uh, the variance of the, uh, the lane position was higher. So uh, this, we thought, was important results, right? So if you're going to put a, a speech recognizer in a car, you better make it work well enough, for one thing. And then uh, be careful, because the st if it starts not working so well, then the press to talk button might become a problem. And honestly, it just kind of gives you an inkling that the press to talk button, there might be something there, right? So this may actually be worth uh, some further, uh, uh, some further uh, study. Just so I'm clear on this, so this is only for the low accuracy condition that's right here. <coughs> yeah. So, that's so the, the idea is that if you're in low accuracy and you've got press to talk, you're getting a higher variance. Yeah. yeah. And so we, you know, you can think about this. Why would this be the case? So presumably, and that's another hypothesis that kind of came out of this, is uh, you're probably frustrated. <laughs> and perhaps you're taking it out on the, uh, on the press to talk. Yeah. And the press to talk was on the wheel or on the? Yes, it was on, on the wheel. wheel. In this case, we moved it onto the wheel. Yeah. yeah. So who are the drivers? Are those policemen? Or These are not policemen. These are uh, subjects that we recruited from the community. And it's mostly. Oh, it's it's diverse, yes. It's um, you know I, I don't have the the statistics off the top of my head, but it was uh, uh, on the order of ten uh, drivers, and they were from UNH, some students, some staff. Yeah. If you needed some related work, there's a kid show uh, called MythBusters, uh -huh. um, where they actually did a comparison. They didn't have the speech or the push to talk, but they compared cell phone driving with cell phones versus um, alcohol. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I've forgotten what the result was, but um, you might consider alcohol as another baseline condition. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'm sure that we'll find students who are going to be willing to. <laughs> so UNH is a dry campus, so this we'll have to get special permission to do these sorts of stuff. But you know, I mean, if <laughs> if that's what it takes to do science, right? Then. Um, okay. So motivated by this. Uh, uh, this um, result that the press to talk uh, button does have an influence on driving performance. We wanted to drill a little, little deeper, and this is an ongoing study that Oscar is working on, uh, in which, again, we had the same task of you know drive on the same route, do the same uh, uh, business of controlling this police radio. Uh, it's a Wizard of Oz again, uh, but now let's again re you know let's review this same speech recognition accuracy high and low, but also let's take a look at what the activation sequence is for the press to talk button. So is it push, hold while you're talking and then release, or is it push and release and then speak and let the endpointing be done automatically, or no push, which uh, thanks to Ed Cottrell we realized this is how we really designed our experiment. But, uh, and then, well, and so let me just say that, uh, in fact, if you look at the last line here, right, uh, if you start out with this, so a push to talk button, do you have no push to talk button, there's, there's ambient recognition, or you have a fixed push to talk button, which is fixed on the steering wheel, or you have this glove, which allows you to, um, um, here's the picture of the glove, so it's basically a glove with a couple of sensors in the thumb and in the, the index finger, and those are basically the switches, the press to talk switches. So this sort of 
instead of instrumenting the, the steering wheel, which is harder, right now you have basically the ability to push any point on the steering wheel and get the, uh, the push to talk button. So back to, uh, oops, back to this. So you have either, you don't have to use a push to talk button. You have this fixed push to talk button, which is on the steering wheel, or you have this glove, which is sort of a floating push to talk button. And these are your three conditions. Now, uh, for these two, you can have push hold release or push release, right? But in fact, for ambient, you can't. So this, hopefully this, um, this here explains it a little better, this uh, table. So you have the push hold release and push release, which makes sense for fixed and glove, but in fact don't make sense for ambient. So that's really uh, sort of a no push condition. Uh, so just if you want to set this up um, um, statistically, I guess this, this would be a good way to look at it. But at any rate, I think that what's important is to, to take uh, from this slide is we have these three conditions for, you know, do you have a push to talk button at all? And if you do, is it floating or is it fixed? And then if you do have a push to talk button, do you have to do push hold release or push release? Now, let me show you a couple of videos of what the interactions look like. So this is, again, the glove. And then here's a video where you'll see a person using the fixed push to talk button. And uh, how, by the way, how, I don't know how the lighting is. Hopefully. Uh, you guys can see, but one option is to potentially turn turn it lower. But um, they, they tend not to like to because okay. Well, let's let's see how it works out. Let's see how it works out. Okay. <laughs> and uh, anyway, you'll, you'll see the press to talk button is here's the steering wheel, and the press to talk button is right here. This person will operate it. There will be a red circle pointing out that she's pushing it, so that that will help. And then there's the leading vehicle. You can see that there's a curve coming up. So this is that curvy road this person's driving on. And, and she's basically following that leading vehicle. That's the primary task. And the secondary task, again, is you know, issue these commands to this police radio about, about um, changing channels. Go to channel 3. Channel 3. Channel 11 and 3. Cancel. 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 Channel Conquer. Channel Okay, so that's the fixed push to talk, and uh, you could see those were those were the um, uh, misunderstandings, right? Where the computer would misunderstand things, and you'd have to fix it, and so forth. Um, now, one thing that get so we're we're still looking at the data, and uh, I think we're probably uh, going to end up collecting some more data, but. One thing that we can certainly say, that one thing that came out of this that was interesting, we thought, was that people actually tended to glance down at the, fi uh, the fixed push to talk button. And I was surprised, because I thought that, you know, it's fixed. There's only one button. It's not, you know, what's there to look down for. But as it turns out, as you'll see in this, in this video, people do. And uh, um, a lot, you know, a lot of the subjects, most of the subjects actually look down uh, very often to see where the, the button is. So what you'll see here, by the way, this is a video from the viewpoint of the eye tracker. So I don't know, Ed can tell us how this compares to uh, uh, the uh, video that he sees on his eye tracker. But a couple of things here. Um, the two vectors here would show you the uh, direction of the eye gaze. And you'll see that will be moving. This is the head position, so the, the direction the head is pointed at. Uh, and the two numbers here, the green will be counting up how many times the person looks down before he presses the button, and then the red will be counting up how many times he does not look down before he presses the button. You'll be able to hear a beep uh, when the button is pressed. So ideally, and, and what's going to happen here is you'll have a bunch of short snippets of basically the person looking down, looking up, pressing. And then I cut off to the next interaction where the person looks down, looks up, and presses. So you can try to sync yourself up with the look down, look up, listen for the beep, look down, look up, listen for the beep. And the beeps are basically when the person will start to issue a command, and I cut that off. That's not fair. <coughs> it's basically, the, the original video shows all the interactions. And this one, in the middle, there's going to be a blacked out spot just because it it's going to be a little too long. Um, so here we go. Zombie Edward. Adam. Zilford. Yeah. Zilford. Adam. Cancel. So look. Austin. Look Cancel. down right now. There's the beep. Frank. Retreat. Cancel. Adam. 
Call me Edward. Alton. Chip. Read it. Hey, Adam. Hey, Adam. Okay, so um, in this particular case, 31 to 23, quite a, quite a large difference, right? So more than half the time this person looked down, even though it's a fixed push the talk button, it's not going anywhere, right? And there's really only one button you could possibly press. Yes? So uh, these are all first-time users. Uh, that's true. And, and I'll get to that. And that's, that's, a, that's a question that, that is worth asking. Is that, does that make a difference? Was the button on the left side of the wheel? Or? It was, and, and, and uh, I was wondering if anybody's going to catch that. But yeah, for some reason, and for so, it, it was on the right side of the wheel. The right and for some reason, the eye tracker gives us the mirror image of the okay. butt. <laughs> Is there any attempt to test maybe push to talk being on the left foot? Uh, we did not do that. I, uh, I think people have done that. We haven't done that. And... Um, I, I can't quote a paper, but I'm not positive that that worked out so well for people. But, but we haven't tested it. Right. That would be more exciting, right? <laughs> yeah. That video went through real quick, but was there some learning even on these uh, 50 trials? Yes. That is, uh, was the first half that it look more and then it would be more red on the second half? Well, as in this particular example, so whether that's a representative example is, you know, question for some statistical work, right? But, but you could see, I don't know if you noticed, but in fact, in this case, the last few glanced, the last few, 10 probably were glanced down. So he definitely glanced, um, it almost looked like it's the opposite. So, so I'm not sure, you know, that's a good question. We, we have to look into that a little more. Um, and then, you know, one thing that is uh, kind of interesting, that's my computer, um, is just the uh, the difficulties that the eye tracker has to go through, right, and the difficulties that Oscar then has cleaning up the data because of the, the various, you know, the person looking one way or the other, the, the eye tracker only has so much of a, uh, an angle that it can track. Uh, and then this last uh, shot here is interesting. See the hand right in front of the camera, which then if you put it right in front of the illumination, that, that kind of messes up the contrast and so forth. So just interesting things that, keep go uh, that go on. Now, let me show you what the glove interaction looks like. So again, go to channel Northfield. Channel Northfield. Go to Zone Truth A. Zone Truth A. Adam. Go to Channel Salem. Channel Salem. So uh, that's how the glove interaction happens. And then take a look at this person again. Uh, and listen for the beeps and look for the glances. Word. Can. Shut him. Zone. Zone. Can. Cancel. Chip field. Can. Chip. Read. Zone. Chip. Read. Zone. So the point is that there are a few, right? So at, the, it, at least for this person, obviously there's no reason to look at your, you know where your index finger is. That You've learned that very early on, right? So, or your thumb. So you can basically do this without looking. So we, we thought that was, I certainly thought that was surprising, but interesting result. Um, one thing that we also looked at that we've had a chance to look at already is uh, where do people actually interact with the push to talk button? By this I mean if, if you think of the car coordinate system, you know, where on the steering wheel do they push the button? So if you have a fixed push to talk button, that depends only on how much you're turning the wheel, right? That gives you exactly the angle of where you're uh, pushing. If you have the glove, then you have to kind of transcribe it so, for example, go to channel Northfield. Channel Northfield. Go to channel Northfield. Channel Northfield. So, Owen, uh, one of the students, right, went through this where he basically overlaid the uh, this fixed coordinate system on the steering wheel and transcribed where people push the glove uh, button. And uh, when you do that, you get this sort of a graph, which shows a couple things. For one. Um, the uh, red, which is the fixed push-to-talk button, is centered around 
roughly the 75 degree bend. So we bend this, obviously it wasn't super precise, right? But roughly the 75 degree bend, which is where if you're heading straight, that's where the steering wheel, that's where on the steering wheel the push to talk button is. Um, the glove push to talk is more towards the 30, 45 degree, which when you think about it, that's the 10 o'clock, two o'clock, set up, right? So if you do what you're told to do in driving school, then that's basically where you're going to push the button. So that's, that's a nice result, we thought. And also, see how it's more spread out, right? The blue versus the red. So we, this is something that we thought would happen, that people would feel more comfortable pressing the button sort of in a wider range of uh, the steering wheel, and that is, that is coming across. Now, you might ask, is that a good thing, right? <laughs> but that's sort of a separate. Push the talk data here. This is where the push and talk button was actually fixed on the steering wheel? The, 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 bu the button is fixed on the steering wheel, and uh, that happens to be in that 75 degree bin when you, you know, and then the only thing you have to do is really look at the... Just on the trials that... Uh, well, that is kind of both. I mean, it's, we could have really uh, placed it anywhere, but that's roughly where if you have a, you know, if you buy a car with a bunch of press to talk buttons, that's where there will be, right? That roughly the center of the steering wheel. Um I think because it would be a possible false alarm, right? If you have a more you, you, you could. And you so could that is uh, I I don't know that we had Oscar, do we have any false we probably have a couple, but not too many. The push to talk buttons are a little uh, you know, they're little micro switches and they do give you um um, what do you call it, uh, tactile feedback that by virtue of being th the way they are. So it's actually not very easy to press them if you don't mean to press them. And they are on the index finger and the thumb, which when you're driving are not, you know, you don't necessarily drive like this. So, so, so it's a, I mean, it's a valid question. You're absolutely right. Um, but it's, it's I, I think the setup is such that that does not happen very often. Um, and uh, so that brings me to the, the last study I wanted to discuss today, this is an ongoing, also an ongoing study of, about navigation. And yes? You didn't show any of the, um, at least I don't think I saw any of the data having to do with variance, et cetera, from lane position. <coughs> yes. So the, Was there any difference between the, the um, push to talk and the... Um, so we're in the process of, of actually looking at that right now. We, uh, we've, in our preliminary analysis, we see that the, the accuracy is showing up, so we're basically reproducing the result that was the previous study, so that's good. And we need to drill down, given that we have this unbalanced uh, data set, we need to actually think about a little more how we're going to process it. So we're, we don't, presumably, if, if this talk was given in a month, I'd, I'd have slightly more results from both, but that's how it is. Um, so navigation, the, the motivation is sort of obvious, right? The personal navigation devices are <laughs> proliferating, so it's interesting to see how they affect driving. And when you think back to that picture that I showed you at the beginning of the talk where the person was, I think, driving and definitely pushing a button, right? Is that such a good idea? And, and of course, even from the very first study I, I showed you where the, the, the radio interaction, you know that that's not a good idea, right? So pressing buttons on a tiny display, that's not going to be so good. Um, but anyway, even if you don't do that, um, we wanted to look at the following. What if you had this task of, you know, follow directions to get to a destination, but then the directions are given in three different possible ways. Uh, one would be you print out your directions from th the web and you get them on a piece of paper and then off you go. Uh, two would be the state of the art. You have a, a personal navigation device that has a graphical user interface and it also gives you uh, voice prompts to, uh, to uh, ha help you take turns. And then the third one is sort of, well, what if you just took away the graphical user interface and you kept the voice prompts only? Would that actually do just as well in terms of getting you to the, lo the destination, but perhaps better in terms of driving performance? And then we vary road conditions because we figured that highway and some sort of a, I call it suburban highway, so basically multi-lanes, but perhaps more curbs and more buildings around. And then city, obviously, th those probably are going to be different scenarios. Uh, are going to act differently. So the cabin setup uh, looks something like this. Here's our personal navigation device GUI. So somewhere where you'd probably put one if you rented a car, right, and you <clears throat> had a bean bag to put it on your dashboard. Um, and then we also have a uh, 
video camera and you'll see some video from this angle of, of what goes on in the car. So um, the map, uh, the, the city part of the map looks something like this and, and something to notice here is that we have some short segments, we have a longer segment and some sort of a middle length segment, right? Because one, idea, one hypothesis is that the length of the segment, the, the amount of time you have to wait for the next uh, prompt will ha actually influence your driving performance. Perhaps you'll get nervous or fidgety or you have to look over. And then one thing we're also interested in, well, how many times do you actually look over at the GPS screen just to look, to see where you are, right? And the argument would be you probably shouldn't look if you don't have to, right? Because looking at the GPS screen is probably not the best idea. And then this is the uh, highway, the straight segment here, the highway, and then what I called earlier this uh, urban highway or something like that. So there are curves here, basically, and also there is some more built up, a more, it's a more built up area. Okay, so here's a video of a person using printed directions. And what you'll see is uh, four video segments. There are three video camera angles that you'll see. This one, so behind the driver, uh, you'll see that video camera from the side that I showed you, and then you'll also see the eye tracker uh, video angle. And at the end, you'll see a segment created in MATLAB, which will just show you what happened with the lane position. And you'll see in this particular case that this person will deviate from the lane that he's in. You see that right now he's on the highway, he's in this particular lane, printed directions are right here, he'll pick them up, and as he picks them up, he'll start moving into the next lane. And you'll see that on, the, uh, on that last segment as well. So let's take a look. I see the glance is interesting. Uh, see how it becomes yellow, by the way, there, which sort of. And then, okay, so here's glance is coming up. Here's a glance. Look at how he started moving, and then he decided, all right, fine, I'll just go. And then multiple glances, right? So here are the glances that he took down, and you see that basically he, as he was getting ready and then took that glance, he basically moved from his lane. This is the lane marker here. He ends up in the next lane. And then at that point, he just says, well, fine, I'll just go to that lane, right? Um, and this is about, so this is about a one meter, so this is, you know, this is a serious distance that he passed, and this is about five seconds of travel time on the, on the x-axis. Now, we did compare that already to what is the state of the art. Well, here is the same driver uh, using the graphical user interface and the speech interface, so that's the state of the art that you have right now. This now is the city scenario, and partly because the video is more interesting when you actually hear some uh, uh, instructions. And so what you'll hear here, or what you will see is, so there's the graphical user interface. You'll see the person glancing over. You'll, you'll, you'll see three segments. You're, the MATLAB segment will not be here. But you'll see again the, this, this angle, the, the angle from the side, and then also from, from the uh, point of view of the eye tracker. You will also hear spoken directions. Uh, and I'll turn this up just to make sure that you hear that. Um, so... In the spoken directions, we'll say something to the effect of, you know, turn right. In 150 yards, turn right and do one way. See those glances. the glances, in this case to the left because it's Turn mirror right. image. And there's another glance, right, on the GPS unit a after he was done with the curve. 
with the turn. And then finally, that same person. In 75 yards, turn right onto Fifth Avenue. This is only speech. The, the graphical user turn interface right. is turned off. Notice that there are no glances anymore, right? So he hears the instructions and follows them and basically looks at the road. In 75 yards, turn right onto Fifth Avenue. Turn right. In 75 yards, turn right onto Fifth Avenue. So look at the steady gaze, right? Turn right. So while we don't actually, we're still actually in the middle of collecting data, um, the data that I've, I've seen show clearly as you'd expect that um, when you have a piece of paper in your hand, your uh, variance of your steering wheel angle and your lane position is visible <laughs> by the naked eye from, a, <laughs> from zoomed out on the map. And uh, just this, right, gives us a good indication that there will be some interesting data as far as the glances are concerned. So we're, we're looking forward to the data collection being completed. Yes. And I have a, I have a slight, uh, yeah. So a quick overview of, uh, you know, what we've learned. Certainly, uh, low speech recognition accuracy is a problem. Um, if you're going to put a, uh, and, and of course, you know, it may not be that big of a problem because people will not use your system, <laughs> but if they decide to use it, uh, they will have uh, issues with their uh, driving performance. Uh, press the talk button is an issue. So the design of the press the talk button, where you put it, what kind of interaction it is, you, you should pay attention to. And then, you know, the question about training. So this business of glancing down. Uh, so one question is, would this person have done this week after week after week? So if we bring back the same subject over and over and over, are they going to stop doing it or no? And I'm not sure that they will, because in fact there is no training going on. No one is telling this person, look, don't look down, right? Uh, so perhaps they'll figure it out, but there is really no feedback that says, you know, you really shouldn't do this. So I'm wondering if in certain situations, bad habits that are formed at the beginning of the user interaction, uh, you know, being figured out by the user are going to stay, because, you know, what, is, what exactly is the training that we give our users? And what exactly is the training that they're willing to to accept. Uh, so we might have to really design for this and, and think about this ahead of time because the bad ha I'm, I'm really uh, of the opinion that the bad habits that they develop early on, unless they crash and then they're told, hey, by the way, that was because you were glancing down, uh, you know, what exactly is the feedback that makes them stop? I'm kind of curious as to whether we could uh, train the users by simply having nothing interesting to look at when they look down. Right. Say they look down, blank screen. Okay. Right. Maybe eventually they'll stop looking because right. they're not finding anything there. And hopefully the, the navigation uh, experiment where they actually had this third condition of you know, the speech only, my, my guess is that that's going to be um, one of the results. So but from the other hand, there is nothing interesting in the push to talk button, but that guy still was looking at that direction over and over and over each time before to press. It's yeah. the same, nothing changes. Yeah. And, and what I'm worried about is that what is the training that tells him don't do this? Um, I, I, don't, I don't think that there's anything, right? So unless he has some self-feedback of, oh boy, you know, I just mm -hmm. almost ran something over because I wasn't looking. So, so one possibility might, might be that people actually believe what they see more than what they hear. Mm -hmm. So maybe if they gain more confidence that this system is actually mm -hmm. really doing a good job, maybe they feel right. more So th this is an, you're absolutely right. It's an open question. I'm not, I don't have an answer. Anything. I mean, there's right. something to see as this recognized measure they want to see. Yeah. <laughs> so, sure. so adultability, too, is also, I mean, they don't hear what was said. They're not sure the visual confirmation. That, right. You know, that's why we use voice prompts. But it, right, right, but it, voice prompts. The notes in the, the, right. the <laughs> right. Yeah, in this case, you know, it, the video may not have sounded great, but in fact, in the car, that was pretty clear. So I don't, I don't think that, yeah. A comparable question, maybe whether or not they look down when they're pressing their cruise control buttons as well. Right. Because that's a completely driving, I mean, I don't know how people use their cruise control yeah. generally, but 
use accelerator and resume and, and decelerator right there. And, and, and they it, looked down on all those as well, or if PPT somehow is better. College kids don't have experience. And, and also, I'm sorry, but you know, that's actually an even, well, the difference is that there are a lot of buttons there, or a lot, you know, more than one anyway. So um, that might give you more of a reason. And also, I wonder how often you use it. Um, so, you know, there, there's something to tactile feedback, or, or you know, just um, diff people make buttons that are of different shape and feel, so that, that might help. Yeah, John. How are your subjects motivated to do a good job driving? The um, stakes are actually pretty low. Here you're right, and, and that's certainly something that, that um, we don't actually, in these designs, we actually don't have a, um, a reward for a particularly uh, a job well done. But I mean, what, what we do ask them to do is, you know, drive as you normally would. And it seems to me, and, and Oscar can, can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that people are pretty excited to be there. They're not unhappy, and, and they're getting paid reasonably well. It's a, I think it's a $20 an hour. Get five dollars more. Okay, so I'm wrong. So in your experiment, oh, that's right. But so in your experiment, we said that for we said in what that case? They would get fifteen dollars if they complete the test, and uh, five more dollars if they do right. I mean, if they uh, try to drive like mm -hmm. reasonably well. Yeah. Is there any option to introduce traffic into those simulations? There is traffic, and you may not have noticed it, but there is ambient traffic, and you can actually control individual cars and make them do things that that um, cut, cut you off or turn or whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. So, so a related question to that is um, thinking about other kinds of metrics of performance that you might use potentially yeah. in variance. And I know one thing that Dario Salvucci has used is following position. Yeah. So in a task where you're, it's basically just sort of your position to the car in front of you and acceleration. Yes. Yeah. So we do have distance to um, cars. However, uh, actually, Tim was suggesting a similar um, metric, which would be, um, you know, the two-second rule. So are you are you too are you tailgating too close? Sure. Yeah, I'm just thinking generally. Well, we do, I'm we looking at that. speed variability. Yeah, we have that number, yeah. so we, we yeah. It would I'm just be a nice thing to look at. Yeah. I think. It seems like the more. The more you have there, I mean, some of those distant differences were real. I mean, you yeah, yeah. can see them, but it's nice when you have a lot of yeah. reinforcing each other. Yeah. Yeah. It, it seemed like some of the conditions that you were, you seen lots of glances, it felt like there was a lot of stress in the video. And I wonder if you could actually measure that on the subject. Yes. Uh, well, <clears throat> so you can't really measure stress, but you, one thing you can measure is uh, skin conductance, for example. And actually, one of my slides talks about that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we think that one reason th that you may be doing poorly is some sort of uh, frustration or stress. And uh, you can, if you know that you're inducing it, then you can, when you measure a change in the skin conductance, you can argue that that's related and that's a measure of an effect of it. In fact, that's what we were planning to do uh, before Jacob decided, before I brought him here. So the next set of experiments we're teasing apart, but, um, Frustration, that frustration caused by, um, you know, uh, different types of frustration measured uh, physiologically, um, depending on frustration, if it's caused by not being able to fulfill the task, um, or if it's caused by some property of the speech interface, and trying to tease that apart as well. Yeah. Um, for the navigation study, if you were designing the speech versus the speech plus screen, um, interfaces. Do you think you, the, the speech might be different between the two? Like if it was only speech, you might say different things? Yeah, and uh, you're absolutely right. So, I mean, one thing is, you know, ideally, you'd have, or pro probably, you, you might be better off with uh, landmarks, right? Right now, what we're doing is sort of trying to get a baseline, right? I think that's fair to say of, you know, well, what, what happens if you don't really change anything but, but move, move the GUI away? However, what we're hoping to learn, both from GUI plus speech, as well as the speech only, is, well, how do people react? For example, what happens with the glances? And that might actually give you an idea of how you should say things differently. So for example, if it turns out that they get fidgety in, on a long stretch, that they normally would have actually looked down onto the GPS to confirm that they're on the right road, the red line is still ahead of them, and there are no, you know, they haven't lost it, um, maybe you should say something along the lines of, you're still doing fine, you're over-repeat, you know, by the way, we'll be taking the exit in a mile. Um, so 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think the uh, drivers will be quite, uh, it's easy to tell which way they prefer between paper, map, sure. and uh, GPS device. Have, they, have you asked them the question, say, hey, do you really prefer a like a ULS touchless speech instruction versus there's yeah. some UI there? Yeah, we are, asking, we are asking the question of, you know, how do they like it and are they happy with it? I, I don't have the numbers. Unfortunately, given that we're still collecting the data, so we're but I and I haven't looked at those numbers to be honest with you. I, I think that would be very yeah. interesting, right? Because I know. agree, they may not like they they may really in, like the visual feedback. So that's. But then again, that that goes back to John's question. So there might be things that you could do differently in the speech that will reassure them. Exactly. And, and when, I, when I was driving, I sometimes I get frustrated you, uh, using the GPS because. Once they say it, they won't. They won't let me say it. what. What did you say? Right. You know, just that this kind of interaction may actually bring the user's confidence. Sure. Or easier, you know. Yeah. Your, your trust sure. the system. Yeah. Yeah. One thing against this only speech interaction is that suppose I'm listening to music, I like a visual thing. Yeah. So I'd rather. I mean, I may even switch off the TTS and just use the. GPS. Sure. So. What is it like? Will the music shut off every time it's only speech only? Maybe you yeah, and you know that that's a that's a good question. On the other hand, I I, I think you know one argument about uh, the visual display is that it's really not that safe, um, right? I mean, looking away from the the road is probably not advisable, especially. I mean, when, when do you actually look at navigation devices? When you're actually lost, right? Or when you're in a new place. So you, in fact, need the information. It's unlikely, at least I can't do a quick glance. I usually, I, I usually, I, I like to travel with my wife and she looks at it. That's the safest setup that we have. <laughs> when you look at it. Right? <laughs> exactly. Well, I know because there's a delay, right? The, the GPS is slightly delayed and I'm, I know I'm, I've missed turns many times because of that. Because is it really now? I don't know. <laughs> the, the trends in the navigation displays are for higher and higher resolution and more and more detailed graphics and more and more information, kind of away from what we used to have with the low res displays where it says, you know, big arrow turning right, yeah. which was, you know, much easier to glance at and, and interpret what that meant. Yeah. And the, which is the sense of information we actually well, we need. Have the, we have the 3D buildings and we have perspective rendering and we have yeah. shadows and drop shadows here and well, you can see the angle of the sun and whether it's raining over there. <laughs> have, you, I don't, have you guys sat in the Prius? The Toyota Prius? Yeah. Well, so what's with that display? They have, this, <coughs> they have this display that shows you, you know, when you start braking then the energy goes from the wheels into the whatever, the battery and then when you step on the accelerator it reverses. How does this matter, you know, and how is this safe? I'm, it is, it is impressive, but boy, it just doesn't seem safe at all because people look at it and then they tell you, look. It's fun to look at from the uh, passengers. That's right, but it's not turned that way. <laughs> I, I own one of those cars and I, I got one of the first that yeah. went in this country. And you learn to ignore that display for yeah. um, because it's so competitive. I mean, what it's basically doing is teaching you how to drive. Because, sure. Um, Whenever you are heavy on, on any change, then you lose gas mileage and it teaches yeah. you that number. Right. Um, and then once you learn how to drive that way, then it yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. So now that we've seen these experiments in some detail, can you give a little bit more information about the human-to-human -human experiments that you guys are talking about? Sure, I, I, can, I can tell you about them. I don't have the slide sure. here for that. But, uh, the, in the human-human interactions, um, basically we're, we're trying to find out, um, in the latest study we've run, is we looked at uh, a task that's, that's similar to the map task, which is uh, there is a driver and there is a dispatcher, and the dispatcher is trying to get you to, from point A to point B. And uh, the problem is that the dispatcher's map and reality don't match. So the dispatcher is telling you to take a right, but there's no right turn. And the reason to do this is so that there will be an ongoing conversation. And uh, our interest is in um, the question, what happens if you have multiple overlapping uh, dialogues with a machine, as well as a hands-busy, eyes-busy task? So for example, the an analogous situation would be that I'm driving and I'm discussing with you 
uh, the study, and Tim is in the car, and, and uh, every now and then he interrupts with, oh, you need to take a right here, um, you know, or, or something along the lines of that, and then I go talk to him about the directions, and then I go back to you. And most likely I'm going to be able to do this without crashing, but if I do that with a computer, it's not clear that it's not going to, it's probably going to influence my driving performance, but also the speech interaction performance, right? And so what do people, right now what we're interested in, how do people do this and what is it that we can learn from human-human interactions? So uh, one study that we've done was uh, looked at uh, adjacency pairs because that's a nice easy way, for, so that's something the electrical engineers that we are can understand. And uh, then take a look at if you have this ongoing task and it's made up of adjacency pairs, where do people interrupt um, within, without, um, and also depending on what kind of urgency that interrupting task has. Um, and we're actually, we're continuing to look at that and now, the, actually the next study, I, I was just talking to uh, Peter Heeman, I don't, you, you got, some of you probably know him from OGI, he's my collaborator on this, and um, we're designing the next experiment where we're thinking about the sort of a 20 question duel being the ongoing task where, you know, you ask a question, you know, you, you, you have a turn and the other person has a turn and whoever gets to the answer first and then having a, uh, another interrupting task, but probably have the, uh, something along the lines of a driver and then a person at another location connected with headsets. Um, so that we, we realized that we didn't have enough, basically in the, the original, the last experiment we had data, but it wasn't probably enough data at the right places. <laughs> so we'd like to actually uh, force a lot more question and answer pairs and then more carefully figure out where we're going to insert the uh, interruptions. I believe there's a study that says that cell phones in, um, are dangerous, but having a passenger in the front seat actually and it's safer than, than driving home. Yeah, is that right? Um, and so that it actually matters if that person is in the car or not. Yeah. yeah. And I wonder if your 20 questions could actually tease that. Right. You might, you might want to talk about the uh, on hot uh, Yes, I'm about to do that. So, um, you know, so, someone asked about um, measuring frustration. So, um, one, you know, I, I wanted to talk about a, a few things of what's next. So, on a smaller scale, uh, perhaps, we're looking at, you know, frustration and, and then specifically in the small scale referring to, well, how do you measure frustration? So, one way to do that is the, to measure skin conductance, which could be the uh, physiological effect of frustration. And uh, uh, skin conductance, uh, we have a nice device that you're supposed to strap on little electrodes onto your fingers, which of course doesn't really work if you're driving because there is, for one thing, motion artifact, right? If it's right on your fingers and you squeeze, then that, that creates problems. So uh, Owen, one of the students, is designing this glove. We like gloves. And he's trying to fix the electrodes in places where the motion artifact will not be so pronounced and you'll still get a decent reading. Uh, so that, that hopefully will be uh, operational soon and then we can uh, run some studies. Now, this, yeah, go ahead. Well, why not just to have a strap here or here and to measure the, the skin? The, you could, the but the signal is not as strong. So the best signal is on your palm and on your hand. So you're right, we might end up having to do that. We wanted to try, give this a try first because the signal is nicer. But you're right, we, uh, we, might, uh, we might have to do that. Um, and then if, if I can remind you of the problems that we uh, wanted to address throughout our studies, the in-car devices versus driving performance and the driving performance versus probability of, of uh, accidents, um, and what Tim and I have been discussing now for a while and we're, we're hoping to reach is this uh, UNH, uh, Tim graciously uh, gave up the naming rights here, uh, obstacle test, right? So the, uh, how about if you could design an obstacle test that if you're driving, you can, and not being distracted, you can get through. So things like uh, you're driving in the city and people are, you know, pulling out in front of you act, or pedestrians jumping out or a car braking, uh, in front of you, and, and you can handle this fine because you're not distracted and, and, and it happens such that it gives you enough time if you, if you drive in a, in a reasonable way. But then what happens if you put a, put a device in there? Does that distract you enough that basically you cannot now pass this unhot test? And if, if that's the case, perhaps this is a good way to then measure 
the impact of these devices and even to create it as a, as a um, uh, quali quali uh, quantitative test of should you put this thing in the car or no. Uh, so this is certainly a, uh, a large goal that we have uh, set out for ourselves. And then tied to this, you know, this is the simulator-based world. Now, to remind you, we, we have this Project 54 system which is deployed in roughly a thousand police cruisers in New Hampshire and maybe a couple hundred around the, the country. Uh, so what you could do is actually tie this unhot test to some law enforcement uh, vehicles as well and get the unhot test to tell you, you know, will this thing work well? And then tie that to some perhaps naturalistic studies, right, that go on in a police cruiser. And we've actually had a pilot completed recently where we looked at how do police officers use the Project 54 system, meaning do they use the speech interface, do they use the graphical interface, or do they use the original hardware interface? And, and uh, let me see if I can, um, yeah. So in this slide, just to remind you, so you have the speech interface, press to talk, and uh, microphone, you have the graphical user interface, and you also have in the center console the original hardware interface. So if you're if you don't want to use whichever, or you know, you're perhaps you're really used to flipping the light switch on, that's the fastest way to do it. Or as it turns out, the radar actually has a remote, and if you, that's the fastest way to catch someone, because you really have to do it quickly. Cars fly by at 80 miles an hour, you can't, you know, if you issue a speech command that says lock, meaning lock, the, the, lock, the speed by the time it gets recognized, the car's gone. So the speech is just not a realistic uh, scenario here. So in this slide, or, or in this this slide here you see, this is what people would see on the graphical user interface and you have an overlay here, sort of a heat map of, well, how many times did a particular speech command get issued? So dark blue would say yes, often, and lighter blue, less often. You know, so some of the, uh, basically we can collect this type of data. So how do people use things in the car? So we think that between the unhot giving us a nice way to predict what's going to happen and then perhaps informing that the design of this unhot test uh, from some of the naturalistic data that we can collect in really a large deployed base that we that we have a good relationship with, uh, we think that we have we have something that that could be interesting. Now I said law enforcement here, but I do want to point out that you know from the point of view of things getting into cars, devices getting into cars, law enforcement is the vanguard because they really use it on a daily basis and they really need it on a daily basis. So this is a nice place to. Uh, to, it's, it's a nice place to study. Um, yes? Are the physical um, button presses and all that stuff also um, instrumented? We can so lock them. Uh, they're, not, they're instrumented by software. So we basically, given that everything is synced up, we know that someone actually pressed the button and we can tell. So, so which is really important because that's, that's a key. Uh, I doubt that they, you know, they sometimes use the graphical user interface, but my guess is they'll flip switches and then they'll talk. I just, I just think it would be really fun to sort of map out, you know, all the commands that are used yeah. and as well as the actual interactions and sort of see where's the balance. How does it yeah. flip over? Oh, okay. Which are the class of things that are always yeah. touched. And that's exactly what we're hoping to. Uh, in fact, the, the pilot was run, I think, last summer, and now we're, we're gearing up to basically deploy this in probably 20-ish cruisers and... Uh, we have a nice statewide setup where we can wirelessly get the data back, so I think that the data should start flowing sometime soon. So a quick set of acknowledgments. The NSF for funding uh, us as well as the USDOJ where the majority of funding comes from. Microsoft Research for multiple things, uh, certainly uh, Tim's uh, collaboration. Uh, also uh, Jayco, uh, one of my grad students, is a Microsoft intern, so that's very much appreciated. Uh, and also the uh, in-kind contribution of software, which we're uh, receiving to, uh, to uh, compensate our uh, uh, subjects in the navigation study. And tell me who provided the uh, voice talent recordings for the uh, navigation study, the turn directions. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to plug my blog. <laughs> I, I, I run this EC blogger blog where uh, Oscar is one of the main contributors. And uh, we have you know, stories that are relevant to the, uh, this particular type of research as well as other stories. So if you ever feel like checking it out, please do. Then let's thank Andy for the Thank you.